Hello, I'm David Hunt. My guest today is Lawrence Johnson. Hello, Lawrence. Oh, no. Lawrence is, get this, so, I'm so impressed, an international award-winning writer, director, and producer in film. He's done some amazing stuff, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's talk about you as a kid. What were you like? <laughs> uh, short. Short. Always have you been. You still have, still are. Still am short. <laughs> but good things come in small packages, yep. as we know. Uh, I used to hang out at the dump a lot. The dump. Yeah, I used Why? to go there because uh, we had a really strong cubby house culture. Ah. Uh, me and sort of kids in the neighbourhood. Yeah. And it was probably come out of uh, living in houses that had domestic violence. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so my parents had a fairly tempestuous marriage, and I think uh, me and some other kids would like to be rather out of the house than in. Yep. And um, one ritual I had was going to the dump. Yeah. You know, Sunday mornings on my Jackson bike, bringing things back, and my mother was ashamed that I would go to the dump initially. And then after that, she was like, oh, what'd you get today? <laughs> well, I'm the sort of person I still find things on the street and take them home. I, I love doing that. So where did it all start for you with film? I, was 20th Century Fox involved somewhere along the way? <laughs> you know it was. <laughs> uh, yes, it was. Um, I left school when I was 15. I came from a working class background in Brisbane. Yep. And I answered an ad for a basically a dispatch boy and I went to an interview and I got the job and it was essentially repairing film at 20th Century Fox. Uh, this was a time when 20th Century Fox had offices all throughout the world. So in Brisbane, there was one, Sydney, Melbourne, whatever. And they essentially were film exchanges, so it's where they held all the film prints for all the theatres. And they would hold also all the advertising photos and posters and things. And I worked in a 16 millimeter library, so I used to repair and rewind film prints that were hired out for schools, you know, shipping lines, um, clubs, film societies, things like that. Yeah. And, but the terrific thing about the job was that basically I was encouraged to buy a projector and could take home any films I wanted. So it was like, you know, the equivalent today would be like, you know, working in a DVD shop and being able to take home anything you wanted. Yeah. But film was much more exclusive then. You yes. Know, um, you didn't have DVD. There was no, no VHS tapes. When a film uh, ended in the theatre, mm. uh, it essentially ended and it was like three or four years before it was on television. Mm. So you do things like I did where I saw A Star Is Born 16 times. Which which version? Oh, there was the Barbra Streisand one right. in the 70s uh, because um, you knew it wasn't going to be around. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's not such a great film, um, but at that time it was fantastic because it was outside culture, outside your home life. Um, it took you somewhere else and yep. film really is an amazing world that takes you into all kinds of places, you know, in terms of stories that are told by people all around the world and that continues today. Yeah. So then you, your love for film was, was there because, you know, like you said that you actually bought your own projector yeah. and took, took film home. So it was a natural progression for you to study film? No, it wasn't a natural progression. Um, it was, I, I basically uh, came to Melbourne and I got a job at Village Roadshow on the back of what I'd been doing at Fox, which was for three years. Why, why Melbourne? Why did you move uh, I fell in love with someone. So my first boyfriend I met in Brisbane. Okay. And then he came from Melbourne. Right. And uh, Fox merged with Columbia Pictures. And so I was one of the last people employed, even though I'd been there for three years. So I was one of the first people to, to let go. And David was working for the Red Cross. And so he was let go. And he was returning to Melbourne, so I followed him here. Village Roadshow, you were yeah. working with them. And um, my background never really prepared me to be a filmmaker. I mean, I come from a very basic background. Nobody in my family is creative uh, in that way. And I kind of met some people who were doing, you know, things at Paran College, photography, etc. And I love photography, and I kind of had a bit of a bent for it. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, then, you know, I, um, I applied to go to film school at Swinburne. And so I you know, got in, I did the three year course of BA and I came out kind of, I guess what you'd call a film school star. Uh, I made a film called Night Out, which was a 50 minute drama. And uh, it was pretty progressive for the time because it was about two men in a gay relationship, uh, open, uh, married in a sense. And it was about uh, an exploration of fidelity and violence. So it was about a guy whose um, boyfriend goes on a business trip one week, one weekend and he's left alone, but he, is obviously unfulfilled, so he goes out and he meets a man on a beach and gets bashed up by a group of bashers. Oh. Uh, poof to bashers. Yep. And so, um, but the, the event basically uncovers the cracks in their marriage, and so it's a story of infidelity, really. And um, 
and trust and I guess a really an exploration of romantic love and expectation between men and and what they want which is pretty much the same as anybody wants in the world um, but it really sort of was a very strong film and I was lucky enough for it to be selected for the Cannes Film Festival um, in a certain regard. Well your yeah. first film? Yeah. Wow so you're like well it was a very powerful film to begin with and then for it to be selected go to Cannes yeah. that's huge. It was fabulous. Yeah. And what, what, what did that do for you? Well things like that basically help your career continue so after Cannes, I, you know, you, you travel with the film, present the film. After that, I went to New York to a queer film festival there called, uh, I think at that time, they were looking for all newfangled uh, titles for queer film festivals. They were never called queer film festivals. Yep. It, was, it wasn't the thing. Yep. You know, you, queer means a completely different thing now. Yeah, well, like yeah. gay in, came around in the 60s or 70s, wasn't it? The well, word gay wasn't around before. This, this particular festival called itself the New Festival. So it was kind of trying to blend itself out in a sense. And then that same year when I come back, I'll come back to that story, but I came back and I started the, the Melbourne Queer Film Festival with Pat Longmore. Wow. And we actually called it the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, only because it was that culture then of trying to in, be more inclusive with women in, yep. a, in a genuine sense mm. um, and honouring that it wasn't just men that came before. So we did that, which you know seems kind of hokey now <laughs> if you think about it, but yeah. that's what we did. Yeah. And uh, we had a great festival with that. But um, coming back to the new festival in New York with the Night Out film, again, I was lucky. Elliot Stein, who um, was a major writer for The Village Voice, saw my film, and he wrote about it in a really big article wow. the next, the, that week when I was in New York. And then he put it on his um, 10 best list along with Bertolucci's The Sheltering Sky and Jane Campion's Sweetie. So that was very special. You're the, this quiet achiever that's had unbelievable success uh, along the way. What have you got? Have you worked it out? What have you got that that's, um, that makes this work? <laughs> like a work? recipe. <laughs> yeah, is there a recipe? Not a recipe, but what what is it? You, you, there's obviously the passion, but al also the picking the right topics to you know, like do a film about. I think the best films that are, are affecting for audiences are the films that touch people. And I guess I've made drama and documentary. And I guess the role of a good director is to, you know, you're, you're essentially a chameleon in a way. You go into a story, you tell it the best way you can, uh, and you tell it in a way, hopefully, that, that is affecting emotionally. Um, you know, I've made films on from Arthur Stace in Eternity to a film about neon signs to Fallout, which was about, you know, Neville Shute writing on the beach about nuclear proliferation. So I've covered quite a few subjects, but in each of them, they're all things that are to do with, to do with life and living and, yep. um, and our existence, I guess, and our human endeavors. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come back to the, the first film that you, you mentioned just in that little group there, Eternity. I was li living in Sydney at the time when that film came out and people started to write Eternity on the, on the pavement again in chalk. Tell us about the person that uh, was um, the doco was about. Well, Arthur Stace essentially was a very unusual figure. He's part of Sydney's eccentric history. And he did a very unusual thing, which some people might laugh at. And when I first heard about it, I kind of did as well. So he wrote the word eternity in perfect copper plate script, as the myth goes, for 40 years across the face of the sidewalks of Sydney. And he had a religious conviction to do that. I have no, I don't share that religious conviction, mm. but I loved the myth an idea of him. And one of the first photographs I saw was in a book called Rat Bags by Keith Dunstan, Dunstan. And then I thought, you know, I sort of did a bit more research and then I kind of found out that that photograph was actually taken in a stairwell at the Sydney Morning Herald building. And that basically informed the whole um, visual style of the film. And so we rec there was a lot of recreation in it. So it's a very romantic film and it tells the story of Stace, who basically came from, you know, um, nowhere and sort of went to World War One, was a stretcher bearer, became a drunkard, was down and out, and apparently, as the myth goes, found God at a, you know, uh, a church um, after hearing a sermon uh, by Ru uh, John Ridley that was called Echoes of Eternity. So as apparently it propelled him to go out and write that word. But my attraction as a filmmaker and storyteller was that basically he was this amazing story, mm. but it was the effect that it had. So people would see this word appear before graffiti ever defaced anything. Yeah. He did it for this length of time, and what I did was, through my research, uh, I went and found people that supported that story, whether they were religious of his conviction 
uh, in his shared his conviction, or whether they were people like Dorothy Hewitt, who was completely not religious, but she wrote about his figure in her novel Bobbin Up in 1958. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martin Sharp, the painter, did these amazing um, paintings and screen prints, which was marketed commercially by the Remo store in uh, Darlinghurst uh, in the 80s and 90s. It just was um, just a fantastic subject. Mm. And when I was at the Cannes Film Festival, I um, was with two other filmmakers, and one of them had made a short film that had been photographed by a guy called Dion Beebe. And Dion uh, essentially came from the film school in Sydney. Yep. And when I saw the film he photographed, I went, I would really love to work with him on my next film, whatever that might be. So I was lucky enough for Tommy to be right, and Dion photographed Eternity. And he won you know, a number of awards for it, and the film won a number of awards, which was great. But the reason I mention him is um, he's become a major success, and he won an Oscar for Memoirs of a Geisha. Oh, wow. And he shot the musical Chicago. Yeah. And he shot Mary Poppins Returns recently. Yeah. and. Um, and he's just shot I Am Woman, the Helen Reddy story yeah, that his yeah. wife has directed. Okay. So um, those things happen like when you say about elements that come together like that are part of the elements that make things successful. It's also collaborating with people that can um, bring out the best, you know. What, what has happened to that, um, uh, that film in, in this year? Well, this year is the 25th anniversary of it. It's been uh, digi digitally restored by the National Film and Sound Archive. Now, and they choose a film a year, is that right? They choose a couple of films a year, yeah. They have a limited budget. And so they basically choose films of historical note or that are, they're kind of like the National li Library in America. Mm. So how does that make you feel where your film has been, you know, like, it was wonderful in its day, but it's now been re restored? Well, it's a deep honour you know, uh, to have, um, have work, have longevity. Uh, I mean, film lives on because of its, its nature and the wonderful thing, it's transportable. So, you know, not only can it be stored forever, it, it can be put away and brought out, mm. taken somewhere else, looked online, whatever. Mm. And, you know, um, I presented it recently at the Sydney Film Festival with Margaret Pomerantz. And again, that was a really special thing because mm. it was at the State Theatre, which is a huge, fabulous, you know, picture palace. Yep. And um, to see Eternity unspool there, you know, it was, re it was beautiful. You'd, you've done a film about a couple, a gay couple, getting married. Tell us about that film. The Night Out film? Yeah. Technically, I, I bring it up in the correlation with marriage because there's been a lot of talk about that mm. in the last few years. Um, the men in that film, the two characters, they were essentially committed to one another. They weren't technically married because at that time, you men did, didn't get married. Yep. I mean, people did, but not very much. But really, they, they, they were living a monogamous life. And the film explores that because, you know, in, in gay life, um, and I think men, you know, um, this is a gross generalisation, but I think that the construction of sexuality between gay men and, and lesbians is very different. And they tie into expectations of domesticity, particularly in our society, I think, too, and, and particularly in American society. The notion that you find someone you fall in love with and that you live with them forever and that they do what your parents did. And that sounds really conservative, but I believe that many people who, have, who are interested in the notion of being in love as time moves on and progresses, they want to know that when they come home at night that the person they fell in love with mm. is going to be there for them. Yep. And so Night Out explores that notion that yep. is this person going to be the person forever mm. or is this just a, you know, a short-term relationship? Mm. And they have differing points of view, so the two characters, and that's what basically splits them apart. And it did very well internationally for you. Yeah. Tell us about Once a Queen. Uh, Once a Queen uh, is a film I made you had a real smile on your face when when, you, when I mentioned it. Well, it's a it's a kind of a little bit of a, a cheeky title, um, and I guess it's because in gay life, you know, once a queen, always a queen. It's a saying. But I went to Grafton, which is a small town in New South Wales, uh, back in two thousand and three, and I um, went to do research. And back in two thousand and four, I went back and shot a documentary film for SBS called Once a Queen. And one of the women there mentioned that. Uh, once a woman's crowned a queen, she's always a queen. So the subject matter is basically, it's about jacaranda queens. <laughs> so they're the hometown queen of Australia. Right, okay, so a hometown queen in this small town, yeah. they do it every, and it's around the jacaranda tree. Yeah, Right. it happens every October. Yep. And this year I'm going up for the queen crowning, as they call it, uh, at the end of October weekend. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that again, coming back to it, is that at the moment I'm writing a feature film 
that's a comedy drama uh, through Screen Australia. That is basically uh, an extension of the documentary I made. So it's basically, it's a, a film about women who live in a town. Um, the, the, the festival itself in real life is run by women. Yep. And the men kind of just do things that they're kind of told <laughs> to do, which I quite like. Yeah. Uh, and it, it follows the lives of three different women of different ages uh, in the town around this spring coming up to the next Jacaranda and the next queen to be crowned. Yeah. And they have a great lingo that was always in the doco I made about who was, a cra who was crowned a queen when or whose daughter was a princess. And we've imbued the film with that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of a bit like an Aussie Steel Magnolias kind of film. Right, okay. Wow, how exciting. But it's at an early stage. And yep. um, I've been working with some new producers and one of them that we have on board, which I'm excited about, is Sue Maslin, who produced The Dressmaker which is one of my f favorite films from the last 10 years. There, there's just ideas all the time. You, you're a real ideas person, aren't you? And you're, you're thinking of something yeah. new. And, and you uh, have to. You have to. Mm -hmm. but, but you're lucky that they actually happen. They get made. You know? a, there are some that don't. There are some that are still, you know, in, the, in different stages or in the drawer. Yep. But one that I did make uh, in 2013 was a film called Fallout, which is very close to my heart because... Um, when I was in school, I read Neville Sh Shute's novel On the Beach about the end of the world. And you may know it's obviously set in Melbourne and mm. it's about the, the nuclear fallout coming over the earth. And when I first read it as a teenager, I was like horrified that this could happen in Australia, let alone the world. Mm. And um, anyway, I it stuck in my craw and I wanted to do a remake of the film, the original film that was made here with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner. Yep. And I talked to Jane Chapman, um, who had produced the piano about it. Mm -hmm. And then we found that someone was going to do a remake for TV, which they did back in 2000. I still wanted to do something. So I eventually got to make Fallout, which explores the relationship between Neville Shute and the producer Stanley Kramer, who had a fallout during the adaptation of the film. But Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner came here in 1959, mm -hmm. which was very unusual because yeah. they brought a huge circus of Hollywood to Melbourne. Yeah. And, you know, Ava Gardner was one of the most beautiful women mm. at that time. And the press had a bit of a field day with them because, you know, Ava didn't really like Melbourne. <laughs> um, so that film, you know, I'm really pleased that that eventually got made. Yeah. Because I started researching it quite a long time before. And I, in the middle of it, I interviewed Gregory Peck. I met Gregory Peck here Whoa. and spent a couple of hours with him at the Windsor Hotel. And his audio is in the Fallout film. Fantastic. You also do a, a bit of commercial stuff as well. You've just finished uh, filming some stuff. What, and what's that about? Well, this is sort of more, I guess, community-based, but it's commercial in a sense. It's uh, essentially a project called Opening Doors Renting for All, and it's about disability in the housing and rental market. And it's essentially creating um, interview videos which are of people who have a disability, whether it's physical or an intellectual disability. And it's basically to break down discrimination and stereotypes with regard to real estate and renting. Um, so, you know, we're creating kind of a package which will be a website um, which is accessible for all to ex to explore everything from, you know, moving in, moving out, uh, bonds and condition reports. But what I brought to it, which I think is, I guess, one of my strengths, there's, there's an emotional edge to it. Yeah. So there are people like, you know, I've interviewed people who, like one woman, you know, she was crossing the road on Elwood Highway. I got hit by a car, was on the bonnet for 40 metres, dropped off, bang, banged her head, oh. had a head injury. Yeah. Gorgeous, you know, um, really together. And it really brought home, I guess, you know, any of us, because we have an idea about what people who are disabled are like, you mm. know, when in fact anybody can become disabled at any time, mm. you know, um, and your life changes. And I've basically tried to elicit out of people those kinds of stories so they can be shared with people. Yep. And so people who may have a disability or have acquired a disability feel that there's a place where if they want to know about some of this information, they can find it. Love because it. the home for everybody is a very important place. Yeah, it certainly is. Mm. Uh, Lawrence, I can't wait for the next five to 10 years to see what you get up to next. Uh, because every time I speak to you and every time I, I read something about you, it's fascinating. So thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. And thank you for doing what you do in, in film. It's, um, it's, it's great stuff. Thank, thank you. you. I'm David Hunt and we'll see you again soon.